Welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here, and you can watch or listen to us every week on RT.ie, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to be reviewing Ireland's performances in the latest Euro 2024 qualifiers against France and the Netherlands very shortly. And later on, we'll talk about the Ireland under 21s and what's happening League of Ireland wise as well. And alongside me today, our former Ireland midfielder Keith Tracy and the 42.ie journalist David Snade. I hope you're both keeping well. I'm good. Yeah, very well, buddy. Yeah, so what we are discussing, first off, it's qualifying Group B. So last Thursday in Paris at the Parc des Princes, Ireland uh, lost 2-0 to France. Chouameni scoring a brilliant goal from um, from long distance, which has actually been a little bit of a narrative when it comes to the, the Irish team. And then Marcus Churam doubled that lead just after half time. And then yesterday, Sunday, the Dutch uh, were over here. Great start from the boys in green. Adam Ida with a penalty four minutes in. But uh, the game sort of got away from them after that, with the Dutch coming back. First penalty of their own by Cody Gakpo on 19 minutes. And then Vout Feghorst in the 56th minute. And before we listen to Stephen Kenny speaking to Tony O'Donoghue who after the match, David, just in terms of uh, this window, obviously the, the end result is two defeats, but mm. perhaps going into it, it wouldn't have been unexpected if you were saying like Ireland were going to come out of it with zero or maybe at max at the max uh, one point. So what did we learn that was new about this team that we didn't know coming into the window? We learned about, well, one of the things we learned more than Anton was in the games where it's a bit more even and maybe you see as a rival to have to try and go and get a result, which is obviously very obvious, but it just reinforces it, especially when you're drawn against France and, and Netherlands and our teams of that calibre. So the reason being that there was so much pressure on these games and that there would have been an expectation to try and get more than what would normally be anticipated is because of what happened, obviously, in Athens. Um, in, in, obviously, when they lost to Greece and, and just the manner of that defeat, that obviously came at a time where you're kind of chasing your tail then, you know, when like Stephen Kenny was speaking about it in the build-up to the France game and then also the build-up to the Dutch game about needing, you know, a performance that all those players giving everything of themselves and, you know, it's not it's not ideal that you need to be talking like that and need to be framing games like that. So we're not early in a campaign, but in the middle of a campaign, maybe if it was the last couple of games and when you would expect things to be a bit tighter and maybe everything on the line and, Throwing caution to the wind and all the rest of it, you'd expect, right? That's when, yeah, that's when it's needed. But when you're talking about in about that and so early in a campaign when you've not even played every team, well, at that, at that point, hadn't even played every team, that just kind of shows you when, when you're up against it. And then, in terms of what we've learned about the Ireland players over over the last couple of games against, against France and the Dutch, more so because it's more so a bit more fresh in the mind against the Dutch, just kind of shows you that. Yeah, Ireland can play front-footed, aggressive football and put a team under pressure and make them uncomfortable, but still have the vulnerabilities where a mistake defensively, a few mistakes, I referenced it, they can be picked apart. The penalty obviously leveled things up. They got back in the game, created another really good chance for like Benny again, with Alan Brown being front-footed, putting them under pressure and the Dutch maybe not learning a lesson and playing into Ireland's hands a little bit. So we've learned that Ireland can play that way and can put it up, but just weren't able to sustain it. Maybe a couple of reasons for that would are obvious in the, in the back of having played in France and the energy levels would have been would have been drained. But then that's obviously when you need to kind of adapt as a management team and all the rest of it and try and make changes and realise beforehand, well, what could what could be done here? Obviously the Dutch had made changes themselves to to their system in the second half. But I think overall we've kind of just seen kind of I mean sums up where where it does feel Ireland are at. You can see positivity, you can see some science, but ultimately not able to get over the line and not able to get get that result when it when it was needed, you know. Yeah, let's listen to Stephen Kenny, who was talking to Tony Dunne, who after the match was to get his assessment and view of the ninety minutes against the Dutch. Stephen, I'm sure you're desperately disappointed with the the result, and that is the end of qualification as such, isn't it? Yeah, within the group, it is. Yeah, we just have to uh, we're obviously see how uh, how do we qualify for playoff in March. So that has to be. Uh, has to be decided over the next uh, couple of months. The game started so well, you couldn't have been happier with the, the high press and what it led to. And uh, Adam took that penalty really well. Yeah, no, I thought, listen, I thought the level of our pressing was, was, uh, was exceptional in that first half. And, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were prepared to go man to man against the top seeds. You know, the Argentina beat them on penalties in the World Cup. Uh, you know, in the quarterfinals. So I think the uh, we were prepared to go man to man right across the pitch. To, we got our we got our reward. 
And to be honest with you, we probably should have capitalised on some counter-attacking situations after we won the prize, after that goal, to create better opportunities than we did. Like we had, a, we won brilliant uh, tackles and recovered it, and we had chances to really go again and create again, and we just didn't capitalise on that. Um, I didn't think really Holland were. They looked like they might have been there for the taking tonight. Well, it's just a. It would, uh, I'm just disappointed with the goal, you know, that we conceded then. You know, it's very disappointed with that, but... They looked like they changed shape at half-time and that gave them the overlap, perhaps? No, they pushed Gapko high on the left as, as their wing-back, which tied Matt Doherty in. Um, but, and it gave them an extra... They could recycle the ball across. But for whatever reason, our energy levels in the first half... Um, we couldn't quite sustain that that level of intensity, which I'm not trying to make excuses, but the, I suppose the, the 90 minutes in Paris, where we put phenomenal effort in, would have probably three days ago probably had an impact on that. But I think, um, nevertheless, we should have been able to, if they're going to have a spell, it's because they're a top international team, they're, they're obviously one of the best teams in Europe, so they're going to have a spell in possession. So when we were, when they forced into that back five, we need to see out that, that div- little difficult period. Because conceding again after yeah. half time, that well, trend well, continues. It's 56 minutes, you know what kind of way? It's, you know, it's 11 minutes. But I think they they uh, we needed to see out that period that, that they got on top. You know, uh, but Stephen, we've said before, it is a results business. Do you feel you've taken this group as far as you can, or do you feel you'll be allowed to take them further? Because there's a lot of potential, but eventually you need to get results. Yeah, you do need to get results. That's obviously been a, a World Cup campaign that we finished toward in the group behind Serbia and, um, you know, behind Serbia and Portugal, uh, who were uh, so we finished toward in a five-team group, and we and we blooded over 20, 20 players. You know in that period I think uh, but you need to find a way to, to win yeah no listen we do and no one's my gosh we're absolutely good that we haven't haven't won there it's, we, it's, a, it's a game to be one of the best teams in Europe um, you have to see out those difficult periods and we, di- we didn't do that for the second goal and I think um, because they didn't create all that could we have changed format you changed eventually to 4-3-3 could you have done that earlier well, we we went three five two for a while, um, you know, in the in the, in the, in that period. But um, you know, do you feel finally, Stephen, that you'll be allowed to finish out this campaign by the FAI? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we've got two matches in in October, and you know, we've got Greece and and Gibraltar in October, and we've got Holland and Amsterdam. And, uh, you know, after that, um, you know, that, that's certainly not my decision. But uh, we, we'll have to see whether we have the playoff in March, okay. which, 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 which is still a chance. And I think, uh, I think the players gave everything tonight. I think in the first half, they were absolutely excellent. Deserved to be, on to- uh, deserved to be in front at half time. But they've come out the wrong side of a game. Games against France are the best team in the world. And, and Holland there tonight are one of the best teams in Europe. So... And we're missing four or five of our, our best players tonight. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Our best we are, the forwards who are building our team around. But it is what it is. We give everything and we come up short. OK, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. That is uh, Stephen Kenny there speaking to Tony O'Donoghue after that 2-1 defeat to the Netherlands last night. And we'll come back to a few aspects that came up in, in the interview. But first, Keith, in terms of what you liked uh, from the first 15 minutes and what and I suppose how Stephen Kenny set up the team, how they approached it front foot, as David said. What did you like um, uh, from from the fixture? Yeah, I thought it was excellent. The first, the first 20, 25 minutes, maybe even half an hour, it was excellent. The the front foot, front front foot press, easy for me to say, was, was excellent. We went man for man with them, and look, I was up in the gods in the Aviva in the media section on level five. So you see the whole spread of the pitch, and you're looking, thinking. If the Dutch can just get one or two passes and beat that initial press, Malin is 1v1 with Duffy, Gakbo is 1v1 with Doherty. So you're watching it thinking, oh God, what's going to happen here? But we were excellent. Alan Brown in particular was jumping, nicking the ball on the 18-yard line. And, you know, a better class of striker. Like, 
Charam against us, his goal, the way he swivels and hits that into the back of the net, that's what mm. we needed Adam Eder to do. He passes the book to Ogbeni. Ogbeni needs to hit a forced time or, you know, have a dribble at Akia. He takes a touch and then, you know, it's quite poor from him as well. So it was a, two poor decisions in a row. And then he nicked it again. And there was one when Eder's Ede is going after Van Dijk and he, he's hustling and bustling to him and he gives a soft free kick and he's basically in on goal there. So it was just the, the hustle and bustle. Nothing was, you know, sexy football. We weren't getting on the half play. There was none of that sort of stuff. There was little bits of nice little play, but generally we were getting the ball out wide. We were putting it into the box. We were putting them under pressure. We were being physical and we were getting rewards from it. Even the, the penalty that we got, uh, it's just a set piece. It's just a corner kick goes into the box. Duffy wins the first contact. And it hits Van Dijk in the hand, and all of a sudden we're one nil up. Now we need it. Could we have changed? I know it's very, very early in the game. The Dutch looked really rattled. McLean and Dumfries were getting into a bit of a physical battle on the line as well. You could see they were getting into each other, and they looked really, really rattled. But look, the, the class they have, I think the main thing. I know they got themselves back into the game, but the big, the big thing for me was Daily Blind coming off for Veghorst and Rinders coming on for Weaver. Because they went to a flat back four then and it just totally changed the game. Veghorst was occupying two of our three centre halves and the other one was going in with Javi Simon. So there was just spaces starting to appear all over the place. And tactically, Ronald Koeman got it right. But that's not a dig at Stephen Kenny, by the way, because Koeman has an awful lot more weapons in his army than we do. And we don't have a plan B. Alan Brown got tired. Doherty got tired. And again, Doherty mm. hasn't played a lot of football. Uh, Brown played really, really well in Paris as well put in a huge shift. So it's not a dig at the lads, but we just ran our legs. There's too many players not playing for the clubs or playing bit parts for the clubs. And they give everything. But again, Raf, you like I come away with hope. You look at the first 45 minutes and think, if we can sustain that, if we can hustle and bustle and keep the fitness levels up and the energy and the work rate and keep it really simple, even the the, the penalty that they win, Matt Doherty's header, don't head that into the pitch. Head that outside the pitch. Their press is within the width of the 18 yard box. So don't try and play in the width of the 18 yard box. Keep it outside of there. And I know he's thinking, I'm in there half. If I lose it, we can recover. But this is a top, top international team. You have to keep that in your head. But again, I don't, I'm not being critical of Matt. He hasn't played an awful lot of football. He's digging in for us. He's getting through it. But it's just little decisions like that, lads. We don't play in them situations. No backward passing, no sideward passing. Keep it really, really simple. And we've proven the Dutch are very good. You look at the back, uh, the centre half for them last night, the, the teams they play for, it's the lit, uh, the lit at Bayern Munich, Van Dijk at Liverpool, Ake at Manchester City. Yeah, a little bit of hustle and bustle, a bit of physicality. And they looked all over the place. So if mm. we can do that to them, why not do that to Gibraltar? Why not do that to Greece? Because we're, we're miles, we're streets ahead of these teams that can play football. So going toe to toe days now, it's just nonsensical. Just make it really simple. Make it a make it a fight, and we can win a couple of games. Yeah, and the issues at uh, wing back, David, was something we talked about on last week's podcast in terms of who was gonna who was gonna get in. Obviously, Matt Doherty wasn't gonna be available in France, and yeah. then what we saw in the France game, Enda Stevens struggled quite badly against Dembele, and then he got taken off at, at half time last night. McLean. Um, I think switched off for just a second. Dumfries gets in behind him for what proved uh, to be the winner. So there, there's certainly issues on that front and we might kind of touch on the system a little bit because obviously the system requires wing backs to be there. Yeah, like that's that's basically how Stephen Kenny has played and like, but in the game last night, like you, you've said it there it, and Stephen Kenny said it even there about the, say, the opportunities and the chances Ireland had and speaking to the players after the game, Nathan Collins reinforced it. It, it did just feel as if it was, it, it was a game of such fine margins. Like I know it's very easy to say, like if this was the, if this was Stephen Kenny at the start of his reign and this was the first campaign, you'd be you'd be thinking right. There's actually so much positivity here where you can build on, you can work on. It's the nature of what Keith is saying there. We're at the stage now where it's a bit into it. You mix, you learn to mix it up a little bit and try and get those get those results. You know what I mean? That's that's where maybe obviously a lack of some goodwill from outside maybe obviously has has dissipated. Like, obviously being there in the stadium at the end didn't feel as if there was a huge amount of anger. It didn't feel as if there was a huge amount of, like, I don't know, people being absolutely like, disgusted with what they've seen. Like, there was a lot, there was an awful lot of positive. There was an awful lot of what we've seen from Ireland throughout the years where they did put it up to a team to a degree and just the nature of where both teams are at. He's going to illustrate it there. We're just even referencing the teams maybe that 
say the back three, even just for for the Dutch played for. But as Keith said, like Ireland put them under pressure, not even just Ireland, like either by himself at times. Like really had Van Dijk uh, scrambling. There was a couple of moments in the first half where the ref actually gave the free against Dido. But then you see, you see at the time you're thinking, no, Van Dijk obviously has a grab of his his jersey. And then you see the photograph of it earlier, and you see the, the look on Van, Van Dijk's face. Like he, there was times where he even just little runs, he, he did really well against them, you know. But then just not able to sustain it, and maybe that's just where Ireland are at, and that's where it comes into it. What Stephen Kenny was saying, and. What we said, it well, that's when you actually just have to try and dig in and find a way of getting through those moments where because it, it's mad, like, even though it's, like, the goal, the goals all came from mistakes. It's not as if maybe Ireland were totally, totally outplayed and ripped open and to shreds. It was moments where Matt Doherty and even as the ball was coming in because he does so well to read the, the pass. Obviously, Van Dijk under hits it. You're pretty thinking, why is he even going first time heading it back into that that area? He could probably even the way the ball was. Of taking it down didn't seem as if he was going to be getting put under a huge amount of pressure but then listen it's easy to say that when you're when you're watching it when you're in the midst of it you probably just think well you'll play a fourth time and get and get rid of it and then obviously yeah McLean just switches off Dumfries is passing Duffy has dropped far too deep but then he, he's only a half yard too deep for the, the goal and then Weghorst has the momentum on the run he gets across him at the near post again and like the, in the wing with even just on the on the wing back situation then it's I don't know. It was just like you're just you're just craving in in that in that second half that Ireland would see out that period because even in the first half when the Dutch did get back into it, they did still seem as if they were happy to just pass it around. Like Frankie Young and covered a lot more ground and actually got around the pitch. He actually gets around the pitch a bit more than he was actually anticipating. In fairness to him, like it was times where he was getting forward and 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 reading kind of little um moments where Ireland could have could have broke. There was a couple of times where he made good interceptions, um. But it did kind of feel as if, if Ireland were just able to even get to that hour mark, then see if they could make a change that they could keep, they could maybe regain a bit of a foothold in it. Because they did it after the Dutch, after the Dutch equalised, your team, there was a few, there was a, another moment after that when, I, can't remember, I think it was Malin got through when he kind of skinned. Yeah, was it was the, Malin, uh, yeah. Yeah, Malin got in when he kind of skinned um, John Egan and uh, kind of got away from him and Nathan Collins done well where he, he pushed him a bit wide and had a sliding tackle and kind of Bazuna made a good save but other than that Ireland were able to regroup and kind of get more of a foothold on it and then it was just just the nature of where they not so much the Greece game but just even the nature of the France game that a moment where they switched off against France Josh Gordon plays that square pass like what Keith was saying where sometimes in the, in the in a moment you, you, you make a better decision Pavard punished Ireland in, in Dublin and then it was a well worth goal, obviously the pass from Frankie Young and Freeze running onto it, and Weghorst had made the run a, a, across Duffy. But I don't know, like it's it's it maybe it maybe it's just because of the nature of the campaign and what it's taken over. But like, it's not a game where you could come away from that saying, you know, what well, Ireland were shown up or Ireland the limitations on what the manager is trying to do were were shown up. It does it did just seem to be that fine margin, and then and that, that punished in that one moment. But the only thing I would say was. Once the Dutch did get ahead in that second half, that's when Ireland they weren't able to find a way of coming back in and, and doing it and getting at them. Like even if it was that the side of hustling and bustling and having that energy, they just weren't able to bring that. And perhaps that is just because as well the nature of the depth of the squad and also considering it was coming off such a big game on, on the tours in Paris as well. Yeah. And in terms of the the system, Keith, I mean, um, I think uh heading into the June window, I remember you mentioned, given it was going to be Greece and Gibraltar, that maybe a tweak in certain games to maybe a 4-3-3 might have been something um, to look at. But of course, in the bigger games against uh, France and the Netherlands, obviously the system is always going to be likely 5-3-2, given what they're going to face. But what's your thoughts on the Irish midfield in terms of their how they work on and off the ball, especially when it comes to managing the tempo? As we saw, some you know, first 15 minutes, brilliant, but then... There's all there's always a little bit of a loss of control. And um obviously last night it would have been Josh Cullen, Jason Knight a little bit further forward, and then Alan Brown in there as well. Yeah, look, to we obviously Stephen Kenny, to be a possession-based team, you have to have players that can play football and, and are really classy on the ball. Like you look at uh, Frankie De Jong last night, nobody really put a tackle into him, and when he did, he just saw him, he just seemed to glide away from him. Our players don't really have that. It's more of a touch tackle type of thing, just a bounce a bounce pass here and there. I like Alan Brown in there. I think he's probably the best footballer of all the midfielders we have. He's probably got the best engine. You know, uh, he, he went and nicked the ball twice on the edge of their box. 
And there was a pullback for uh, Javi Simons in the second mm. half that he went and nicked off his toe as well. So he can do a shift both ways. But in terms of, of dictating the play, you know, there's ways to dictate the play without having the ball. If we want to play this high energy football and, you know, Raf, to be honest, we, we, we can't control games because we don't have footballers in the middle of the pitch. And you can say when we keep the ball, we generally keep it at the back, which is, it's not great for us. And when you're passing the ball backwards or sideways, the other team is shaping their press against you. So you're just essentially playing into a trap. That's If you're playing into a trap, that's fine. If you know you have a player in the midfield that you can fizz it into and he can play out. We don't have that player. When he's put under pressure, we generally lose it. So just I would say just bypass the midfield. Just bypass it, get numbers in, get Alan Brown ringing the edge of the box, get out Benny nice and raw, running at people, try and get Obafemi into the team. And look, when Ferguson comes back, a lot of people might be tempted to say, can we try and play a bit more football now? I don't think so. I think, again, we need to make the bedrock of our team is a really, really strong defence, bypass the midfield, try and get Evan Ferguson a chance and just nick games that way. And look, people will be shouting Mick McCarthy at me and I'm a dinosaur, but you have to cut your cloth accordingly. We don't have the players there. We've been banging our head off of this wall now for a couple of years and it's just not there. The lads individually are progressing, but you can't be coming in, you know, off of not playing for your club and coming in and being asked to play this type of football. It's too demanding. So we have to simplify it for the group we have. And for me, like even some of the things that Stephen Kenny saying there in the in the press conference after when he's saying we deserve to be ahead of half time. I'm not so sure about that, Raf. Like, you know, we had the penalty, we we hustled and bustled, we did very well, but Malin ran through twice, Bazunu makes two great saves. And from a really cynical point of view, Bazunu should have been sent off. Let's be honest, he gets rounded, he's about to tap the ball into the back of the net. That for me is as straight a red card as you'll ever see, and we got away with it. But you know. To say we, we fought and we competed, we did, but it's the Greece game. The Greece game killed them. And obviously we're talking, when you think about it, they had 10 days in Turkey in a training camp and they turned up like a bunch of strangers. So again, it's the Greece game. We've we've three games left. And to be honest with you, Raph, I think Gibraltar might be eyeing us up and thinking, can we catch the Irish rather? And we're looking at Greece thinking, we can we catch Greece? We need to be looking over our shoulders here. And, you know, I said if we finished third in this group, we'd have been right on par. Finishing part, finishing fourth is not great, but believe me, I think Gibraltar will be eyeing us up. Yeah, and it all comes down to fine margins. Something D.D. Hamman mentioned on the panel on RT2 after the game last night. So let's just listen to that. Uh, there's also another clip we'll play later on, just in terms of Richie Sadler, which is more related to Stephen Kenny and uh, the future. But first, uh, Dietmar Hamman here. It's no shame going to Paris and losing there yeah. to an ill. It's no shame losing to the Netherlands, mm. even though I think or I felt they were there for the taking today yeah. because every time mm. Ireland attacked, every time there was a set piece, it looked like conceding. They did need to lose that game tonight. And the manager came out after the France game saying, this is only the first time that we get beat by more than one goal. Now he's lost about 20 odd games now in his, in, his, in his reign. And he tried to sell us that losing by one goal is actually not that bad, but in fact, I think it's the worst thing that can happen because he lost more games than he's won and the goal difference is positive. So that means when they do win, you know, the likes of Qatar, Luxembourg, they're beaten by three or four goals. But every time the going gets tough, every time there's a tight game, they find a way to get beat. And this is a sign of a weak team. Now you can argue, well, these players don't play for clubs like yeah. the Dutch players play yeah. or the French players. or. Is Greece any better than us? Finland got 12 points, Scotland got 15 points now. Mm. All the nations do it. And to say, well, we're working towards Euros 24, or maybe now he's coming out saying, well, now we work towards the World Cup in two years' time, it's just not good enough. Because short term, you've got to get results. If you want to change something, you've got to do it mid-long term. But if you haven't got the results, if you didn't get the results, at some st stage, your time will come to an end. And I think he's been very fortunate to still be in a job. and. As I said, it's the third time now mm. that at the halfway stage, we are out the running. And you have to stay in the group because once you take it to the penultimate game or the last game, these guys make mistakes. As we've seen tonight, as we've seen before, you've got to put him under pressure in games and also in the group. The team didn't do that. And um, as I said, I think the team is a lot better than what they showed in the last one and a half or two years. All right, so coming back to the last point he made there, and I, I guess the, the line that jumps out uh, that, that Didi Hammond said, it's a sign of a weak team. Uh, Keith, uh, it, where, 
if if it is the sign of a weak team that they're sort of losing games, marginal games, regardless of the opposition, is that something to do with the quality of the players or the way they're set up? Or are we somewhere in between that? I think it's somewhere in between. And some of the some of the stats that, you know, can get manipulated, have we done this, have we done that? Look, the French, we lost 2-0 against the French, but if the, if the French wanted to stand on our throat, I think they could have done it at any time. I think they went into a energy conserving mode. They hit the post and Mbappe had won that roll across the six-yard box. He should have put away. So we were maybe looking to get away with a 2-0 loss there. And again, you know, if you're looking at it from cynical eyes, I think the Dutch dominated for the second 45 minutes. We didn't have any shots on target. Yes, so look, in, in terms of what do we do going forward, I think we just, the, the blueprint is there for what we have to do. It just has to be a really clear message from Steve and Kenny, from, from anybody that, that may even be coming into the job, that we have to cut our, our cloth accordingly. If, we, if it's a 4 4 2 and we do it like that, then we do it like that. But it, it, it does start to great on you because I do feel that there's a way we can win games of football. And look, we torn up against the Dutch, we torn up against the French against the lower teams, the Greece, that might give us a bit of respect and drop down into a lower block. Can we break them down? Well, if they're going to drop into a lower block, that means we can put balls into the box. That's going to, that's that's fine for us, no problem. If they're going to go toe-to-toe with us, it's like we, we can't go toe-to-toe. Every time we've gone toe-to-toe with people, we struggled. So I think we get it really simple. We, we know when you come to the Aviva, you're going to get high energy, high pressure, you're going to get put under pressure. And they're treated, treated really, really decent centre-halves and they look really shaky. Like Van Dijk's coming with a huge reputation. He just running into the channel and he looks really, really uncomfortable with a bit of physical physical hustle and bustle. So play to our strengths a little bit more. Don't complicate it. And hopefully those players that we need in the midfield will come along and we can start to progress the style of play. But it is what it is at the minute, Raf. And look, I don't think we'd be qualifying for anything playing sexy football. Yeah, and David, I, I suppose this falls into the longer term debate, like prior to before Kenny came in, you know, there were a lot of frustrating performances against um, kind of quite a variety of teams where I think there was a frustration with the style of uh, play that Ireland were producing prior to his time. Kenny has tried to come in and try to progress things. Um, but this, it, it, it feels like we're at a slight uh, tipping point if we're kind of going back to something that's a little bit more pragmatic um, at a time where Kenny, though, and I guess the prevailing mood in Irish football before that was trying to move to something that's akin to what you would call more modern football. Yeah, and like I know, I can understand where, where what Keith is saying about, you know, the style of football and saying about the sexy football and all the rest of it. And, and but what I would say is that if Ireland were making the same mistakes and making the same issues in terms of how they were trying to play in possession as they were early on in Stephen Kenny's reign, then then you'd be like, well, actually, do you know what? This just isn't working. And even in terms of having a couple of years of trying to implement it, it isn't working. But like that's not what Stephen Kenny and, and Ireland have been doing like at, at times as well. You know, I do feel as if he has been, he has, and he's always been that way in terms of having that element of, say, realism and pragmatism about well, actually how do you actually hurt a team and you've seen that even with his change of when he did go to a back three and even how we say a player like Jason Malumbi and having that more of the energy and would and even Alan Brown becoming more prominent the fact that initially Seamus Coleman wouldn't have been say using the squad but when he realised well actually he's a very important fellow we need him in terms of that personality and that character and the fact that he was still performing well he came back into the side so like I do I, like and in that game yesterday I don't think it was a case that Ireland lost the game because they tried to go toe to toe with the Dutch in terms of trying to pass them off the pitch, or even in the previous game, even against Greece. Against Greece, it was it was the basics that he had set up to do against Greece that let Ireland down, not defending well enough. Do you know, and having say Callum O'Dowd obviously and and Nathan Collins had that second goal, especially in Greece, is the one that really stands out. And that moment in that period in the first half in Greece as well away. And it is the game everyone can come back to because it did feel like such an outlier at the point where it did actually look as if Ireland were totally disorganised and a rabble. It genuinely hasn't felt like that over the last couple of campaigns. I, like That's part of the issue. It kind of feels as if, you know, well, you can see where they're trying to get to and where they're going to, but they're just not capable of getting over the line. That's where it has felt. And like, I know like the whole, that start of not losing the goal or not losing the game by more than, by more than one goal and the, and the point that, Haman makes about maybe being a being a weak team, but again, I this is just looking at it. You don't get that sense. You just feel as if it's a team. You just feel as if it's a team that can get to a certain point and just aren't capable, 
aren't capable of getting over the line and doing more to actually win a game, or on the opposite on the opposite side of it, and this is where I would I, I would definitely be able to the key to superior knowledge in terms of understanding when you, a manager or a coach realize should realize well actually a tweak is needed and a change is needed because it has felt as if there's been games on the edge that could have gone either way, and that's why it has been that one goal defeat that Ireland just haven't been able to actually spot certain things in games, be it the players or the management, and then get and then do it, and that's what I thought from last night. That's what. Like didn't feel as if it was a case that Ireland kind of were silly in how they were playing. I thought they approached the game perfectly, especially in the first half, and then faded, but then just weren't able to do something different, weren't able to change it, weren't able to actually kind of find, well, actually, do you know what? There's a weakness here that we could get at. Like, there's a moment, there's a couple of moments, and again, it, it just referencing it because it came out in my head. Uh, it was in my notes from the match last night where when Holland or the Dutch would have a goal kick, you would see it where almost the two deepest players for Ireland were actually James McLean and Duffy because this was obviously in the, in the first half when you would see um, Gakpo would be dropping almost in as one of the midfielders. John Egan would be following. And then on the other, on the other side, sorry, yeah, John Egan would be following. And then on the other side, Simon would be dropping in and then Nathan Collins would be going. Really, and they were being really aggressive and really, and, and, and really positive. But then when that, when that was, when that, changed in the second half when that wasn't happening and they didn't have to do that and actually the onus was on them to actually find another way and actually just adapt that's when I thought Ireland struggled and it was that moment and that's what they have to, as players but also as coaches we have to realise it where when that change happens in a game adapt quicker and got immediately used the phrase you have to, that they didn't cop onto it and sometimes that just, that's what it was you know it was, and then that moment the Dutch got their chance and they killed Ireland yeah, um, there has been obviously a bit of discussion in and around Stephen Kenny's future as well. Of course, his uh, contract runs out at the end of this campaign. There's still the possibility of a playoff, but we might touch on that a little bit later on. Although it's uh, it's quite uncertain at this stage. And mm. as we're talking, of course, th- there is a there, the rounds of games aren't over. There's matches tonight, Tuesday night as well. So the the picture is still quite fluid. But let's listen to Richie Sadler, who was also on the RT two panel last night, and what he had to say in regards to Kenny and what the future looks like. Like. FBI basically have a decision now going that there, there, there's no argument that anyone can make anywhere credibly saying that Stephen deserves a new contract. I'm firm on that now. I, I said the opposite over the last couple of campaigns, but I think we're at the stage now. It's whether or not the FAI can sit back and go, is there merit in making the change before the final game? We may have a playoff in March. What, what is the discussion around the merit of replacing him in the meantime? This is a difficult, I, I don't like. No, it's a difficult we don't, conversation. No, this to is have. an awful conversation, yeah. but that's where we're at. This is a game at senior level where results matter. He's had more patience, more support from the crowd, from the media, from the FAI than anyone else has been given, given the run of results he's had. All right, so Richie Sadler there on the panel on RT2. And as he said himself there, obviously, it's a difficult conversation to have, especially when you're talking about somebody's uh, livelihood, uh, of course, as well. But, um, Keith, just in regards to the future, um, of course, as I said, uh, Stephen Kenny's contract runs until the end of the campaign. After that, it's uncertain. And even as Richie Sadler saying there, it might be a little bit uncertain even before that. There's still a couple of rounds of games to go in October um, and November. But what's your thoughts on the future in terms of the, the management team um, in the short term or even into the into the medium term, um, considering if there's a playoff as well? Yeah, uh, well, I think it, it's basically a question of when, not if now. I think we all expect Stephen Kenny to go uh, if that's when his contract finishes then so be it if it's if it's over the next couple of days hours weeks whatever it is then it could be but that, that's up to the FEI and I, I've tried to guess what the FEI are going to do many times over the years Raph, and I've never got it right so I probably won't get this right but look I think if, you, if you're a manager from the outside looking in and you're interested in the oil job you want to get in the hot seat as soon as possible because you know, we, we've three decent enough games coming up from the outside looking in. I know the Dutch away is a very tall order, but New Zealand in a friendly after that as well. Greece, Gibraltar, a new manager will be thinking, I can start to shape a team and just write off this this uh, this campaign and start putting my fingerprints on the team. And look, again, it is hard to say because Stephen's still in the position and we don't want to be, to be speculating all that. But I have to be honest, Raph, I do think it's a, it's a case of when and not if now that, that Stephen will be walking away from the job. And yeah. there, there's part of the issue and it's something that again trying to frame up but when he did sign his new contract and I saw this report as well over the weekend in the in the Sunday Times but when he did sign his new contract in 2021 there would have been different break clauses in it in terms of if he, were, if he was to leave that he wouldn't have to maybe pay up a certain amount of uh, money and stuff I don't know if that's 
if that one of those clauses is, is is around this period. But it's just it, that's the nature of where we're at in terms of the considerations now where where the FAI have to come from, you know. That's that's the, the debate now is well actually and again this is something that even written as well, like some of the people in the FAI who would have been some of his backers and supporting him, their that level maybe has has now went. So like people who before would have very happily in the FAI made changes already and if they had their way would have wanted to try and uh, push for change, they'd be the ones obviously would who'll be who'll be driving this more. And that's obviously now because of the nature of, of the results, they just haven't they haven't materialized. The the question now is for the FAI, well, like again, as it would as it was made clear to people over the last while in terms of trying to get an idea of well, where the FAI are here, what's the thinking was well, they wanted to see how this this window went, you know what I mean? So now it's a case of well, had they already made contact with anybody to kind of sound them out, like any any organization in terms of football. If you're talking about if this was if this was a football club, I am um, not obviously a national team, and a manager was coming under this type of pressure, and you had these type of games coming up where you're not expected to win, and you kind of know what the writing could be on the wall. You would imagine a football club how it's run, like would have already by now made contact with someone. I'll well, be honest at the moment, I don't know if that's the case within the FAI, but. Uh, considering that they have got two more games in October, the only way it makes sense now to make a change before October is if they have the person who they want to replace Stephen Kenny, if that's where they're even going now, to actually come in. It makes absolutely no sense. It would be ridiculous to get rid of them now in terms of where they're at now if they haven't got someone lined up and they know for a fact it's going to be coming in in October because they can't take that risk of making a decision on the basis that they could be doing it now because it's not going to cost them money depending on what the break clause or whatever it could be. And then not actually having the succession thing in progress. Otherwise, you're going to be in a situation, say, with the women's national team who have their Nations League campaign starting in a couple of weeks' time when you have an interim manager that's absolutely no use to anybody. Then it just leaves you in a state of limbo. And then the manager will be coming in if it is. And this is where we're, we're talking about this because that's the way it's been, the nature of how it is in, at senior international football when, when you, you get to a past the middle stage of a of a campaign and your your chances of automatic qualification are up and as you've already referenced here the fact that the playoff scenario with the Nations League and all the rest of it is so still up in the air like this is a new FAI apparently do you know what I mean but where are they at here what's have they got something in mind here have, you, have they got a plan in place because you can't go and make a decision now and it's not on a whim let's be honest it's not as if they just decided actually oh do you know we've had enough like it's been brewing for some people on the board in the FAI and people in, in the FAI to 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 make a change. But unless they know who they have coming in to hit the ground running and, as Keith was saying, come in and work with players and get a sense of it at the end of a campaign so they can start the next campaign ready to go, it makes absolutely no sense to make a change now. Yeah, and also I think in the timing in terms of the September window, I think everyone knew this would be the hardest window and the least likely to pick up points as well. So I, I would have found it a little bit strange if to, things are being fixed. Yeah. Sorry, Ralph, just to play devil's advocate on that, I know in hindsight it's, it's easy to comment on these things, but the French game, you know, I, I don't think anybody expected us to win with, with the heat that was over there, one of the best teams in the world, blah, blah, blah. blah. With the way the Dutch game went, that was one all at half time. The second half, we needed we needed more tempo, more energy, keep it up, keep it going, sustain it for longer, put them under more pressure. And we just ran out of legs. So in hindsight, could Stephen Kenny have just wrote off that French game and not play Alan Brown, not play Ida, not play Chidozi or Benny, who looked tired towards the end? Would a more astute international manager, somebody who was a bit longer in the two, somebody who has a bit of credit in the banker, somebody who wasn't under as much pressure, would they have yeah. been able to make that call? Stephen Kenny was under too much pressure to say, "I chop and I'll change my team for the French game." For the French game, sorry. Yeah. So it's just a, it's a bit of devil's advocate. No, you're right. You're hundred percent. No, you're hundred percent right. And that that's why it comes back to the Greece game. That again, it's so mad, but that that brings you back to the importance of that game. Like Ireland shouldn't have been going into this window thinking we like we need to get a, we need to get a win here. Do you know what I mean? Like, this was like, wrote off beforehand, and it should have like, stayed wrote off. Like this should have been the window where you're thinking, you know what, a draw, a draw in one of these games is great. It keeps us keeps the show on the road. And like what I said at the start, that's when you're talking, right? We need the performance of our lives in one of the last two games rather than needing it at this stage. That's why that Greece game was so important, you know. And that's that's also Stephen Kenny knew that his staff knew that. That's the reason why, on the back of the fact that when when that game was, the fact that it was like they had that that camp in uh, in Turkey was a case of and, and pre that as well they had the camp in Bristol for a lot of the championship the players in the in, in the EFL because he wanted them to be hitting the ground running that because in the previous summer 
when players have been off, they struggled, you know, and like speaking to players on and off the record, speaking to people who were at camp where, uh, was, that's one of the surprising things was how disorganized, like Keith said it earlier and he was right, like they looked like a, b- a bunch of strangers who rocked up together and that he just arrived the day before for that game because before that the mood and the sense was that actually a lot of good work had been done but then when it came to implementing it or if it was a case of implementing it but also what they were told to implement it just didn't work because you got back Greece tactically seemed to get the better of Ireland and when I well not saying they did but but playing a lot a lot wider and actually creating a lot more space and making the pitch so much bigger and Ireland just struggled so that's why in this game again he said right if Ireland had managed to get a result in that game against Greece he could have went into that France game and Stephen Kenny could have went into it and said you know what like let's be honest here we don't need to go and get a big result here we need to just like keep lads a bit of a run here keep the guys ticking over for this Dutch game that's the game we're targeting and if he was able to but he hadn't got enough credit in the bank hadn't got enough in the group to be able to do that he needed to draw and try and get something that's where that's from this window that's where Ireland have been at you know um, and that's why he couldn't do it but and that comes back down to again not not getting the results in the games like those this the games where you should be getting trying to get a result at least that's where it comes back to haunt you yeah, and of course, uh, with Nations League struggles as well. So the playoff picture, again, as I said, subject to change. But just at the time of speaking, of course, Albania's victory over Poland has reduced the margin again because it looks like, as it stands, Poland would need to go through uh, a playoff. And they're, they're mm-hmm. in League A, obviously Ireland in League B. And uh, there's Norway ahead in terms of the reckoning um, in that. Obviously, as I said, subject to change. So it won't linger too long on that. But of course, the next window then, Greece... Um, come to Dublin for the on the 13th of October and then three days after that it's Gibraltar away and then of course rounding out the year then the Dutch away on 18th November and friendly against New Zealand on the 21st if there is a playoff it wouldn't be till uh, till next March and obviously football moves quite quickly but just um, next up the, the Ireland under 21s uh, they did beat Turkey came back from uh, a goal down twice uh, to win 3-2 um, in the opening of their Euro qualifier and uh, Andrew Moran uh, won the goal Zach Gilson with a penalty and then Idamo Maku with the uh, late winner and Jim Crawford uh, the under 21s manager um, he was speaking to Darren Frehel after the game I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know where to start on, on this one tonight. Uh, what about your general feelings after that roller coaster ride? Ah, look, it was a it was a fantastic performance in terms of character to go, you know, um, behind twice and to show grit, determination, and 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 ability to get back into the game. Um, you know, when we were a goal down, we conceded. You know, uh, a couple of chances after that, and you know, we had our rocky moments, but. They showed real, real character, you know, and, and Andy Moran's goal to get us back in it. First of all, it was a, f- a fantastic finish. And then, you know, we, we could have stopped the cross. And then all of a sudden there was, a, you know, another runner in the far post that um, put them 2-1 up. And you're sort of thinking, OK, we probably need to change things around a bit. And uh, we did. We got back to all. And, and one thing we did say is that let's get after the game. You know, we're not going to settle for a point. And they done that, and, and I knew they would. The way they've come in Sunday till now, it doesn't surprise me, you know. Uh, we've been through a few moments uh, with this group already, you know. Like we went down to 10 men here in March, we came back in June, we had a, um, you know, a, a strange uh, international window in, in June, but the, the togetherness and the, and the pride that these boys show playing for their country is, I think, was just a... Um, it was shown out there this evening. An eventful match on the field, but also off it as well. There was one moment, one of your players, from our viewpoint, appeared to be headbutted, Jim. Did you see that? I seen it. He was and, head- and what did you see? I, he was headbutted. 100% he was headbutted. And I was, I was saying it to the fourth official, he was headbutted. How can I see it? And he didn't see it. And of course, I get a yellow card for, for uh, picking up on something that was horrendous. And then he goes and books the wrong player. You know, but look... It is what it is, and um, uh, we lost. It was, a bit, it was a bit tense there on the line with the other bench as well, wasn't it? At times. Yeah, look, it was. You know, look, there was all sorts of carry on going on, but look, we were fine with it, and you know, game finished. Everybody shook hands. It was, it was an emotional night, and uh, I'm just delighted we got our three points. You know, great start to the campaign. I spoke to you beforehand about the difficulty in this group and, and how tough it is. 
Where does this leave you in terms of going forward? Now, San Marino on Tuesday, but does it give you great confidence going forward for the rest of this campaign? Yeah, that's what winning does. It, it, it brings confidence. And I think, you know, we played against Ukraine. who got into the semi-finals as well um, in the European Championships this year in June. And we, we, we fell behind in, in that game too, and they showed character. We went to... to 10 men against Iceland, we show character there. So it's, it's, you know, for me, it's a great start for us. It's a great start. And, you know, I think that's, that underpins what this group is about. It's character and what a start, three points. Now, San Marino becomes the most important game for this group on Tuesday. Well done tonight, Jim. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and that is the Ireland Under Twenty One head coach Jim Crawford speaking afterwards, and it was uh, <laughs> there was a lot happening in this game, David. I mean, in terms of yeah. you know, there was obviously even I think it even got lost at the end that Rowan got sent off uh, yeah, yeah. In stages, but uh, Turkey were on top in certain moments, but at the same time, Ireland showed a lot of metal to to come out on top. I was deadly. It was brilliant watching this game. It was like you watch underage some underage games, say underage under twenty ones, and you know it's. It's kind of it looks very good technically and all the rest of the very nice games. And it's almost as if one team says, Right, you have the ball, we'll try and get the ball. Well, you know, you have it and then we'll, we'll get it and then we'll have it and you'll get it, blah, blah, blah. But it was, there was just an edge to this game from the for, from the first half. Obviously, like, yeah, it was a penalty torque. You got the, got the lead at, at a point when Ireland were, were, were playing well. Obviously, Ireland got, got back level. Like, Andrew Morland, we're talking about like, this is a bit it's, like this is a big season for him, even in his own career at, at club now that he's got his long move to uh to Blackburn, you know, Keith's neck of the woods there as well. So, like, yeah, what you call it, awareness. And but like, even just little moments, and that's what you need in games. It's just li- his little moment where his goal was so superb, but the way the ball, yeah, like the control more than that, and the way the ball because he, 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 he's worth watching back because it's not as if it's one of them where you know he has ages to judge it and take his touch, the ball was like. The slingshot it out to him almost, you know what I mean? And it's great, the reaction to just throw his foot out and and kill it, and then to have the, the ability and the technique. Like it's it said in the clip there by by Jim Crawford, but it was it was like it was resilience, character, but it was ability as well to actually, yeah, have that character about you to come back against Turkey and put it back up to them, but then create the moment and like like the moment for the penalty for 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 Ireland's penalty in the second half when they got back into him and um. Was it was it always a uh, Gilzean? Was that, is that, that that's who it was? In, uh, the lad who's at Blackburn as well. Who oh, very okay. Zach, Zach Gilson. Yeah, Gilson. Yeah, but it was that moment beforehand again for Morden, and he kind of he described it after the match where he, he realized like I have a chance to get torn and get into the box and drive, but his feet it was the technical side of, it of at that point quick feet was able to bit of a bit of a dummy a bit of a shimmy get past the lad get into the box and get a penalty and like. It was, there was enough contact in it to get to get the penalty. I thought he might have got a bit of the ball as well, but it, it's the type of the decision you're going to get as a in that moment, you know. But it was that little moment where it, it felt as if this was an Ireland team that had been playing together for a couple of years. Not a new, it's a new group. You know what I mean? Like the twenty ones previously, obviously got got to the playoff and were beaten by by Israel. Like it's almost entirely a new a new group of players that that group had come to at the end of its cycle. You throw in the fact that I know isn't Sinclair Armstrong now has gone back and linked up with the twenty ones for the game with San Marino. Like he got called up to the to the seniors on the day of the game. He would have started that that match. You would imagine in in place of uh, of Johnny Kenny. But like overall, it was just it was a really it was just a great performance f- f- from Ireland in it in in a game that actually didn't fit. It felt as if it wasn't just like the first game of a group. It was like and it didn't even feel as if it was a typical maybe under twenty ones game. There was a serious edge to it. And this group of Ireland players really stood up, but again, crucially, when it really mattered, summed up by even the winner when Springer came on and the run with with Sam Courts linking up with them down that right side, and then the little pull, like the the pull back, but the, the the run. I think it would have been so easy for Ireland and Amaku to have just kept on running and with the momentum and all the rest of it that was going and try and make a run near post, and it would have been easy to clear. But just that bit of bit of clarity to say, no, I'm going to make the run, check, hold back. And wait in the middle of the box where your striker is, where it, where you want them, and then you can just go to finish in. It was it was just sensational finish of the game because it was that where it was a game that was won by a bit of character, but having that quality in those moments to actually go and do it and win it. 
Yeah, and as uh, Jim Crawford said himself, San Marino is a huge game for uh, for the Irish team there. That's coming up Tuesday, as in tomorrow. And uh, live on RT2 and the RT player from 7pm. And David, I know this is uh, the life of a journalist. You've got to dash off now. So uh, I'll, I'll let oh, you go. Wish. Thanks for thanks for coming on today. And then uh, myself and Keith will uh, carry on for a little while now. No worries. Take care, lads. All the best. See you later, right, David. See ya. Let's, bye-bye. And um, Keith, just in terms of, um, you know, Blackburn Rovers as a as a home for players. Obviously, you um you had your time there towards the start of your uh, your career, and obviously Andrew Moore and a talent who's had a few cameos in the Brighton first team, and then Zach Gilson, who was mentioned there, who um scored and then set up a winner in the FL Cup against Walsall uh, a few weeks back. Um, you know, there's and he has an interesting background. Would have um just with his, I think his uh, family background as well. He lived abroad for much of his time. Was at Barcelona's academy, then later at Liverpool. But in terms of Blackburn being a good place for young players to be uh, nowadays um w- what's your thoughts on in terms of the i suppose the uh, the platform it provides for the, for those two lads in particular yeah blackbones uh blackbones underage system is, is brilliant it's it's one of the best or it definitely was one of the best when i went to when i went to blackbone probably what was it 15 years ago now but it's still the facilities are excellent and any player going in there will be will be really looked after and look they're obviously all very technically gifted coaches. He would be getting the the best coach and the best management, the best nutrition, the best physios, the best of everything there and the best facilities. And the one thing that, you know, is good for Andrew Moran is that some of the people in the black in the background, the Blackburn, i.e. the secretaries, the people that work in the kitchens, they're really good people. They're family people. They'll look after you. you know, when I moved over there, I was large. I was 15 years old. I, I was moving over by myself and, there was a lot of people that got around me and it, it, it helped me out a lot. And yeah, look, I, I think with Andrew Moore in there, when I hear he's at Blackburn, it makes me think, lovely, that's a match made in heaven. You know, if 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 he does go into any ebbs or any lows, then I'm sure there'll be people in and around Blackburn that'll dig him out of it. Yeah, and he had a really good game in that match. Obviously, as the goal yeah. people can watch on um, the RT Soccer uh, Twitter as well because it was a it was a quality finish. And um, you know, be somebody maybe be, with Evan Ferguson taking a lot of the spotlight, maybe more, and has slipped under the radar a little bit. But he has a lot of ability. Uh, just in terms of good news stories, though, elsewhere, Katie McCabe being nominated for the Women's Ballon d'Or, and um, Keith, I think this this can't be underestimated that is a that is a huge that is a huge achievement because we're talking about it's a very select group of players that end up being selected for something like this yeah we're talking elite elite players in the world here and for for katie mckay for an irish player to be in the mix of that is is, is an excellent achievement and I, th- I think it's brilliant for katie because a lot of uh, i know the fear of power stuff has left a bit of a sour taste in the mouth and a lot of people are show- throwing stuff at katie as well for waving her hands and it sort of detracting from how well the women have done over the last uh, 18 months, two years. And Katie's a big, big part of that. She's played very, very well for Arsenal in the Premier League. And she's done brilliantly for for, Ars- uh, for Ireland. Sorry, she's been a brilliant captain, a brilliant leader. And, and she's drove us forward over the last 18 months. So for her to be in that mixer, you know, fingers crossed that she goes on to win it. But like you said, Raph, it's a very, you know, just to be in that, in that conversation is excellent for her. And hopefully she gets it because it'd be some boast, wouldn't it, we ever say you've won the Ballon d'Or? Yeah, I I don't think in the end she's going to be obviously. I think one of the Spain players who won the World Cup probably is going to be the the ones that are going to win it. But like even yeah, being nominated for anything like that is uh, great. And as you alluded to as well, she's had a bit of criticism from people online, and I suppose it's the nature of social media. But in fairness, Vera Power herself in that interview with Tony Donahue uh, a couple of weeks ago actually came out and said, you know, they've had a conversation, they're fine, and any criticism needs to really stop at this point. But in the champion, Women's Champions League, Shelburne's journey ended with a 2-0 defeat at Glasgow City, and that was in Lithuania. But uh, the third, uh, third, fourth place playoff in that, Shelburne did win in the end, beating Cardiff City 3-0. But in terms of Europe, that's uh, that's over. In the Women's Premier Division, though, on Saturday, obviously Shell's not involved because of the um, commitments in Europe, but Galway beating DLR Waves 2-0, Athlone beating Bowes 5-0, Wexford 4-0 winners over Treaty United, Shamrock Rovers beating Sligo Rovers 4-0, and the leaders, P-Mount, 5-0 winners over Cork City what it does to the table P-Mount 9 points clear at the top uh, ahead of Shells and Shamrock Rovers who both have a game in hand and then Galway United uh, 5 points behind them and Bowles 2 points further back and Wexford starting to pick up points now just a point behind Bowles and uh, next up will be the Women's Cup quarterfinals this weekend where Shells will be back in action against DLR Waves, Bulls against Sligo Rovers, Athlone against P-Mount. They're all Saturday and then Sunday Cork City against Shamrock Rovers. And then in the men's 
First division at the weekend, uh, Finn Harps lost 4-0 at home to Waterford. Uh, Wexford were 2-1 winners at Treaty. Uh, Kerry and Longford uh, Town drew nil all, and then Galway United uh, were 4-1 winners over Bray Wanderers. And uh, that was a hat-trick for Stephen Walsh in that game, and they're now just four points from wrapping up the first division title with six games to go, and, of course, automatic promotion with all of that. And then also in the Kerry-Longford game, um, the Gardaí did uh, put out a statement because there were some angry scenes towards the end with uh, alleged uh, racial remark made towards one of the Kerry FC players and uh, uh, Kerry in a statement said uh, or sorry the Gardaí in a uh, in a statement on Saturday uh, told RT Sport that Gardaí and Trilly are investigating all the circumstances of a public order incident that occurred at a sports ground on Friday evening 8th September 2023. Investigations are ongoing at this time. There is no, no specific hate crime legislation on the statute books. An integral and essential part of every criminal investigation is to determine the motivation of any alleged offence. Um, and then the other result in the first division, of course, Saturday, Cove Ramblers 1-0 winners over Athlone Town. But we're coming up to the FAI Cup quarterfinals, Keith, and some intriguing fixtures. And it's the fact that Shamrock Rovers aren't in it anymore and Derry City are also eliminated. It's really opened the doors. So Friday, it's Cork City against Wexford, Galway United against Dundalk, Drogheda against Bowes, and then Finn Harps uh, against St. Pat's. And really here, um, St. Pat's will probably be the favourites, arguably, to, to go all the way. But to be honest, it's very, very open. Yeah, it's very, very open. We, we were talking about this just off air, Raph, and you rightly point out that Pat's away to Finn Harps. You would imagine that Pat's will be able to get that one over the line. It, it's no disrespect to Finn Harps, but when you look at the two teams on paper, you would you would assume that Pat's will have enough to get that over there. But I don't expect it to be easy, but I expect Pat's to get it done. And Galway Dundalk's not a bad game. You know, Galway going well in the fourth division. I think they'll be bang up for it as well. They'll want to take a scalp, a Premier League scalp at home as well. So, that's a very intriguing game, and I was with Pat Fenner last night doing uh, doing the the analysis of the Ireland game, and I was picking his brains about Bowes and Drott. And believe me, he's him and Bowes in particular are not overlooking Drott. Did they know how rigid uh, Drott they can be? They have a little bit of little bit of stardust with the likes of Darren Markey as well that can link the play and can make things happen out of nothing. So, you know, there could be shocks here all over the place, but. Again, looking on paper, you would think it, it it would go with the with the so called bigger boys, but Cork and Wexford as well. You know, you a lot of people tipping a uh, like the look of Wexford and Cork scrapping in around the bottom of the Premier League. I know Rory Keaton's in great form, so they they will have ambitions of maybe getting to a cup final as well and taking a bit of pressure out of the out of the league. And yeah, I, I think there's intriguing toys all over the place, and it, like you say, Raf, with Rovers and Derry not being in it, I think. Dundalk, Pats, Bowes in particular will be licking their lips thinking we could get a bit of silverware this season. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned Rovers or Shamrock Rovers and Derry City there. They've got a, a big game on Friday as well um, at the top of the Premier Division. So uh, Derry City beat UCD 5-0 away um, on Wednesday, just gone. And that has uh, cut the gap to, to four points. And if they were to beat Shamrock Rovers at home at the Ryan McBride Brandywell Stadium, obviously it goes down to one point. Uh, how do you view this game in terms of, you know, we've seen we've seen Shamrock Rovers go go to Derry and you know pick up results at, at certain times, but also Derry have shown good form. Uh, you know, the, the Paul McMullen in particular has been a great addition uh, addition to their team. So it's very finely balanced. Obviously, Shamrock Rovers know a draw is a great result for them, but uh, it this is a this is a hard one to call. Yeah, a, a hard one to call. I, I, I was at the, the Rovers and Bowes game and, you know, again, Rovers, there was those moments, probably the first 10 minutes, Bowes looked good. They were getting the ball down the wings and Ro, uh, Rovers didn't look didn't look great, but they just seemed to weather that storm, get over that. And then once Lee Gray scores that header, it, it was basically the straw that broke the camel's back for, for Bowes. They did a bit of huffing and puffing, but generally Rovers just grew into the game and got stronger and stronger and they they... They just outclassed Bowes, really, and that that's the end of Bowes' um Bowes title racing. Look, going up now against the uh, against Derry. Look, Derry have a, a great team. Some of the some of the the names on the team sheet are excellent. The likes of Paul Mullen that you're saying, Adam O'Reilly, Diallo, Patching, Cavanagh. These are all brilliant, brilliant players. McElhenney, brilliant players. It's just who turns up on the night. But I have to be honest, Raf. I'm watching Rovers over the last couple of weeks since they come out of Europe. Huge disappointment with that. But in the league, it seems to me like they've just started to turn a corner. I know 
you could still say well, the performances aren't exactly what you'd expect from Shamrock Rovers. Yeah, I, I take that to a certain degree, but they're just starting to get better and better and better. And you can see them starting to pull away. And this is a huge, huge game. I think every neutral in the land is, is praying that Derry can go and, and get the win and you know throw it back into the fire for everybody. But I don't know. I, I can't see Rovers going up there and losing. I think they, they just have a bit too much class. They have players that have been in this position. Lee Grace, Ronan Finn, Lopez, clearly. McManus, they, uh, Manus in the goal. They, they know what they're doing. And Rory Gaffney up front. It's just a bundle of energy running the channel. So even Graham Bork as well, you know, he's he got he was really good against Bowers playing in between the lines. So look, it's two brilliant teams, probably the two best teams in the in the Irish League at the minute going toe to toe. And I think we'll get a very good game. But I expect Rovers to either draw, you know, it, they'll nullify a lot of what they have and get the draw, or they'll go and win the game. Yeah, and not to be underestimated as well on the Saturday night Sligo Rovers against UCD and this is huge for Sligo I don't think that can be you can't underestimate that given how close Cork City have got to them after the, the 3 nil result uh, the previous week and Sligo will go in as favourites but as we've seen UCD can make things awkward for any level of opposition Yeah, it's it's a massive game for Sligo isn't it? And you're, th- like you're looking at that Sligo squad and you're thinking you know, you, you wouldn't be too critical of them. That they're probably be in around where they should be. Maybe seven, six, they could be fighting for there. But you know, it certain certain aspects of the play have been too reactive, too passive. They've been standoffish in their defending at times as well, and they've got punished. And you know, losing Max Matta as well is is a big, big one for them. When they lost him, they lost an awful lot of goals out of the team. And Cork have Rory Keaton who was scoring goals, so they've chased them down and. They're only three points behind Sligo now, so they have the bit in between their teeth thinking if we can get out of this relegation playoff, this relegation playoff spot, then it's a, it's a fantastic season for Cork. But if Sligo slip in there, you know, you, you don't want to be playing one of the big boys in the fourth division because obviously their confidence is really, really low. But I think it's obvious enough to say that UCD have been written off now. They're pretty much gone. So it's a, it's a straight shootout between Cork and Sligo. And, to me, it seems like Cork have all the momentum and they're the horse who has the momentum going towards the line. So Sligo are looking over their shoulders really, really nervously and it's a huge game against UCD. Any slip up there and Cork are chomping at the bit. Yeah, and I suppose finally, before, uh, before I let you go, uh, Jack Moylan having signed now a pre-contract with Lincoln City and of course they're managed by the former Ireland international Mark Kennedy so there's two sides this obviously Shelburne would have you know I think they would have realistically known at some point um, he would be moving on um, but then at the same time it's a big opportunity for Moylan as well in League One with a club like Lincoln City where there's a huge number of Irish there's a big Irish contingent that have moved over in recent times like Danny Van Droy being probably one of the more recent ones who's gone there and um, established himself as well yeah, it, it's brilliant for, for Jack Moylan going over there. Mark Kennedy, an ex Belbo boy. I've met him a few times. He really knows his stuff. And he will, he won't just, you know, bring Jack Moylan into the building, see him when he's when he's in the training building and see how he uh, how he is there. I, I, I imagine he will look after him outside the outside the training ground and try and embed him into the, into what they do there. And a League One, a League One move from the League of Ireland Club. What a move, brilliant move, and there's every chance now. Jack Moylan probably thinks this is a million miles away, but I can assure him that it's not. If he starts scoring goals for Lincoln and putting in some decent some decent appearances, there's every chance he could get himself into the Irish team. And look, I'm not saying he's going to go in there and start. I, I think we all know Evan Ferguson is going to be the, the forefront of our attack for a long, long time. But why not hustle yourself into the way to, into the Irish team? You know, he has all the ability. He's big, he's strong, he's agile, he can finish as well. So every chance to go over there find your feet and you could find yourself in the Irish squad and climbing the leagues in England. It's a brilliant opportunity for him and I'm sure Mark Kennedy will give him every chance to fulfil his potential. All right, we'll see how he gets on anyway in the longer term, but uh, that's it for this week. Uh, you can watch Ireland Under-21s against San Marino on RT2 and the RT Player on Tuesday and uh, we're going to be back next week. And uh, Keith, uh, thanks very much for your time. Cheers, Raph.